talk to to see you all here for a minute i thought that i will be talking to a wall but <laughs> it won't happen so i'm really glad that everyone's here and uh, yeah, so today's topic is Spring Modulit, and the subtitle is Will It Save Us All? So we will see down the line. Uh, okay, so before I introduce myself and, and speak about today's topic, I will present you the agenda, uh, introduction, we'll speak about the brief history of software architecture, uh, then we also have a look at the current state of things in the world of architecture. Uh, then we'll look at the Spring model it, and we'll summarize it all. So let's get started. Uh, yeah, hi again. I'm I'm Marek Ivanuk. Uh, I have roughly more than six uh, years of experience in software engineering, uh, and I've been working with the banking systems, with marketing technology. I was also some time ago uh, doing some tools and technologies for the game development industry. So uh, that's a brief introduction Introduction of mine. I also, uh, in terms of architecture, I worked with the monoliths. I call them Stonehenge monoliths. Uh, I also worked with the microservices architecture uh, in a few projects, uh, which I called the Space Odyssey. Uh, and today I will try to shed a light on my perspective uh, on the architecture in general and uh, more related to the Spring model it. Uh, also about me, I'm passionate about tech, computer graphics, and also about modified cars. So if you are into those things, feel free to ping me. Uh, and my goal here today is to give you some perspective on the architecture, uh, some broader one, uh, so that you can have your own opinion on it uh, and also introduce you to an interesting solution which i think uh, is interesting <laughs> we'll see if it is uh, yeah so first of all let's start with the history of the software architecture but it's a brief history uh, as you can see on the image uh, we had some evolution in this in this space uh, so first of all back in the day the software started as those big monoliths. So these are the applications that are, you know, everything's packed into one application, everything's in one place. Uh, but sooner or later, software engineers, architects, and, and business found out that this is probably not the best solution long-term for each instance. And uh, businesses found something called the service-oriented architecture, so, SOA, you could call it, right? So uh, in this architecture, there are a few big systems that talk to each other. Uh, and they, you know, as in the monoliths, the, the purpose of this one application was, this program was, you know, to solve some business problems, software, uh, Service-oriented architecture does the same, but it utilizes different, I mean, a few, maybe a bit more services to do it. Uh, but as, as the time passed by, uh, we found out that, uh, you know, services, they, they are cool, but maybe we should make them more granular, right? So uh, make them more specialized. And then the microservices architecture was born. And that's, uh, you know, one of the leading architectures in today's world of software engineering, especially in the uh, business. Uh, and we have this fourth person here, which, <laughs> which says that, guys, maybe it's not the best way to go here. So let's see. Uh, so I created this this uh, table to see what are the pros and cons of each of those technologies or rather uh, architectures. So for monoliths, uh, it's very it's very cool for us developers to to work on these things from the perspective of of development because uh, if we do something for the monoliths, it's pretty much you know we have everything in one place and it simplifies things a lot. 
uh, also the performance in some cases, because uh, if we if we have everything in one application, we don't need to make any external calls or maybe not that much uh, over the internet to any other services. So we we have the performance on our site in some cases. Uh, easier development, as I said, uh, also low initial overhead, because if we develop a monolithic application, then we know that, you know, we have one way of deploying this uh, this application, we don't need to worry about complex CI, CD pipelines, stuff like that. Uh, but on the other side, uh, there might be some problems with the scalability. Uh, because if we have everything packed into one application, then it's hard for us to scale some of the features, so to speak, right? Uh, so it becomes a problem. Uh, another one is tight coupling. What's great on one side could be bad on the other and tight coupling makes it uh, sometimes difficult for for the teams to reason about the code or you know to introduce new features uh, for that uh, and also the maintenance part because uh, those who know they know <laughs> uh, those who worked on the legacy systems that were built you know throughout the decades it's hard to maintain monoliths because oftentimes it's a you know big ball of mud uh, as they speak, right? Because every feature, maybe not every, but many features might be tangled into other features. There could be many code smells and things can get nasty. Uh, also, mono monoliths can be a problem for large teams. So for instance, if we have hundreds of developers working on a code. Uh, if we, if our team works on, on one piece of code, right, we might interfere with the work of another team. And this becomes a hassle to, to manage and to work in such scenario. But when the SOA came, service-oriented architecture, mm, the pros are as follows. So software-oriented architecture allows for the modularity so if we have you know different modules they talk to each other and it is it's easier for us to to reason about these things because we don't have this one big chunk it's more you know modular also reusability because if the services are split then you know in other services we can reuse the functionality of that one particular service so it's also great improved scalability uh, if we have different services, we can scale them autonomously. We don't need to scale the whole application. We can just scale one particular service. Uh, and also tech flexibility, which stands for, you know, in one service, we can use Java. In other service, we can use, for instance, C++ or Python or whatever the business needs. Uh, but with SAW, there are also some cons. Uh, so the complexity is getting bigger and bigger because when the services come in, the new services come in, the complexity becomes bigger than when we had just one application to work with. There is also overhead if we plan to build an application or the whole system, there needs to be a lot of thought put into how this will be built. We cannot just you know say that we will be building stuff, we need to plan things out. Uh, slower performance, of course, if we send things over the internet or over the cable connection or whatever you want, uh, it, it's slower than if we had it in one application. And also the governance. So the security is becoming harder when we have distributed system uh, rather than having everything in one place. But the next iteration, so to speak, of the service-oriented architecture is microservices. Uh, it's also better than, in some cases, than what it used to be in case of SOA. So we have this independent scaling. So in case of microservices, we have those plenty, you know, services that can be scaled autonomously. Uh, so each feature that we need to have scaled so that it supports, you know, 
millions of users, for instance, then we are we are ready to do it. Uh, the coupling and modularity, it's also on the higher level than it was in, in SOA. So it's it's also a great thing if if our need is to to be more modular and decoupled. And <clears throat> one of the biggest uh, pros for that is the fault isolation. So in monoliths, if something failed, it could bring down the whole application. But in microservices, when something happens, it usually happens within one microservice. And other services, they you know, are fault tolerant, or at least they should be, and they can recover uh, when they cannot call some particular service. Uh, also, tech flexibility it allows for even bigger tech flexibility because each microservice can be also in, in different technology, or if not the, the language, then maybe framework or any other library. Mm. Continuous deployment. Uh, so if we have those microservices, we need to have pipelines for deploying them. And it allows us for, you know, continuously changing some parts of the system. So for instance, if we, if in case of monoliths, we had to deploy the whole application in one big chunk, it would take a lot of time. But in case of microservices, we can deploy one service, you know, multiple times a day even. But on the other side, there are some cons. So operational complexity. If there are plenty of microservices, it becomes harder and harder to, to operate on them, to manage stuff. Network latency and failures. The same as we talked about in SOA, but even to the higher degree, because we have plenty moving pieces in here. Data consistency. Uh, the One of the best... Um, practices for microservices for every microservice to have its own database. So it becomes a problem when we have a lot of this data, right? Sometimes we need to replicate it. Sometimes we need to, you know, make sure that that it's synchronized. So there are plenty of challenges in that field. Development overhead and team coordination. So generally managing all that becomes becomes a big hassle. Uh, and yeah, I I place those pictures uh, that remind me of each of those architectures, uh, so it's easier for me to reason about it when I think of these. So, what's the current state of things? How does it look like for the present day? So, as we know, microservices are widely adopted. Uh, plenty of uh, businesses, enterprises use them for their uh, infrastructure for their solutions. Uh, and the thing is that microservices, while they solve some problems, they introduce <laughs> some other problems. And there are some companies that, you know, they, they stepped back and they looked at their systems and they were like, you know what, we need to get back from it. So companies like Amazon in their Prime Video product, Uber, Twitter, and Airbnb, while well, they were moving from service-oriented architecture into the microservices, they, at some point in the last few years, they started considering, you know, maybe we should uh, get back and actually merge some of those microservices into some larger services because it's hard for us to work on these things. Um, yeah, and you could compare it to the this matrix scene, you know, stopping many bullets. So microservices could be those many bullets. Uh, yeah, so if we talk about the microservices, we could also think of the sh of their shortcomings and why would we need to, you know, get back from these even. Uh, I mean, from, from microservices, why should we abandon them? So there is high operational overhead. If uh, if you ever worked in, in this setting, then you might know the pain where, you know, you need to implement some feature 
but it spans over multiple teams, over multiple like services, right? And when something easy that should be done in like one day, it it becomes harder because you need to communicate to other teams, you need to communicate to the managers, you need to get some decisions done, right? Some agreements and stuff. So it's it becomes harder and harder to to work in such environment. Also on the technical side, it's harder to debug and troubleshoot those systems because if everything's distributed, then you know you cannot just run your own one application, right? And then debug it. We usually need to run multiple applications or sometimes even instances of those applications to debug stuff and to find bugs because it's software. Mm, as I said, small changes can cascade uh, and deployment, versioning. Uh, if you have multiple services, you need to version them properly. You need to version the API. Uh, you need to take care of other services that use this API so that they stay compliant. You need to make sure that, you know, if not the latest version, we should support previous versions. Also, um, I hope you, you get where I'm going with this. Team coordination, that's more on the managerial side of things. So yeah, some of us been there seen that and we are fed up with it <laughs> so the bright future we recognize that there is a problem and you know we can stand in front of the sun and think what's best for us in the future some of the companies that i mentioned they came up with the term macro services it's basically going back to the service-oriented architecture, but with the other name, but who cares? It's a new term, right? Self-contained systems. So these systems are pretty much smaller systems that encapsulate uh, some part of the system from the back end to the front end delivery and stuff, and they just cooperate with others. Is this architecture could this architecture be, you know, answer to our problems? Maybe. And right in this left corner, there's also a modular monoliths. It's uh, maybe not a new trend, but the this buzzword of monoliths uh, is becoming, you know, uh, more widely known uh, last years or months. Uh, so that's actually why we met here today to discuss the modular monoliths and how can they help us. I've seen this instance uh, a few times where a company wanted, uh, had this, you know, legacy monolith that they wanted to refactor into the microservices. And uh, it's usually starts like this. We have this old software, legacy software that our clients use and we make it more modern. We want to scale it. We want to be sure that development teams are efficient while working on, on this software. So let's rewrite it to microservices. It's a you know trend, trending thing plenty other tech companies use it so why not use it uh, actually the this reasoning reasoning can have its <laughs> big downsides because uh, even one company or the project that I worked for they they decided that they go this path they had this one monolith or rather two monoliths right and they wanted to create this microservice ecosystem. And from what I know, for the last four years, they mainly were architecting stuff and not much done was done in, in terms of development. So maybe it's not the best way to go, right? To just rewrite everything to microservices because there are plenty of other problems when migrating the systems that already work to some new architecture and making sure that nothing breaks along the way. So 
maybe we could use some intermediate step. So let's uh, look at this scenario. There is a monolithic application, legacy application. Uh, so, you know, we could look at it this way. Let's partition the system, but not into the microservices right away, but let's make it a bit more, a bit better, right? So let's split it into the modules within this one application. And then if there is a need, for instance, if we want to scale one of those modules so that, you know, it's independently scalable, we could refactor it to the microservice. Or, you know, we could make everything microservices, but along the way, we actually make some progress instead of just having this legacy application and building microservices uh, on the side and then trying to, you know, deploy them and have it all working. So Spring model it. Could it be the answer to the problem? Well, maybe. Let's see what it is. Uh, so what actually is it? So as we know that the Spring framework is this large, mm, large project which consists of many other sub projects and they generally you know help us build the enterprise software or any other software but for enterprise use it's very uh, battle tested and useful so it's a project in the spring framework and then the spring project uh, but for bu building those modular monoliths that we talked about just now uh what are the mm, the cons of this or what are the features so first of all first of these is it focuses on modular design uh, within a single application so it uh, takes the monolithic application and it allows us to make to split it into the modules that work with each other uh it also gives us the event-driven architecture support. So it's a big thing which was in the service-oriented architecture where we had those services, right? And we usually had this enterprise service bus, this single system, which took messages from you know, those services and it sent them to some other uh, services. So it's basically the same concept. Uh, and we will see how we can use it. Uh, Built-in support for domain-driven design, DDD. It's also a widely mm, adopted term or like methodology of creating software. And uh, in a minute, we will also see how Spring Model it allows it for us to to develop domain-driven domain-driven applications. Uh, of course, it. Uh, also leverages the Spring ecosystem as every of those projects that are in the Spring project. Mm, and one other plus is the is that the Spring module it allows us for clear module bond boundaries and dependencies. So uh, you know we could split our application into the modules without the Spring module it but Spring Module it delivers us some cool features that help us for defining those clear module boundaries. Okay, I have prepared a quick demo for all of us to look at it. It's a very simple application. I just wanted to, to visualize for us some stuff. Uh, so this is the e-commerce application, right? And it has three modules that we have here. So the order order module, also the user module and inventory module. Uh, each module is defined with this module class, right? And we have this annotation that we can use to annotate that it's a spring module module, right? And we define it the same way in each of these. Uh, so our application basically starts with the order controller and 
it takes uh, this request for placing order and we just send the order ID to it, right? And then we have a service which actually implements the business logic of handling that, right? So what interesting can we see here? Place order in the service, right? It could do some business logic in here, but there are other services that might depend on it. Like for instance, the inventory module, right? Or service, which should be notified somehow of, you know, handling the order placement. So in this case, what Spring module it provides us with, it's a generally a Spring construct, the application event publisher. So this part allows us for using the event driven design, right? Because instead of calling the services right away, like in this scenario, which is commented here, it's like, ooh, brother, what's that, right? <laughs> what is it? If we use it this way, we have the tight coupling of the whole order module to this inventory module because the inventory service is in this module, right? So what we do instead is we create the event and we just publish it. And if we go to the inventory module and if we go to the service, we actually have the listener here, which listens for the events. And if this events, you know, this event triggers, then it can just catch it and process the logic uh, or this, this, you know, event with its logic. Uh, but also we could reuse it for other services, right? So for instance, in user service, there could be an instance that, you know, if user places a uh, order, then we want to handle it somehow for the user. So we can use just the same thing in here, uh, handle order placed, right? Just the same thing. What uh, differs here is we use uh, just the event listener here. And here in the inventory service, we use application module listener. If we pick underneath, there are some more technical details around it. So yeah, basically this makes it asynchronous, transactional. Uh, yeah, basically these two things uh, in terms of the Spring module stuff. Okay, so we have this, our simple, rather simple application, right? And we can see that, you know, there are modules in here but we also have some tests and I would like you to, I would like to show some interesting stuff in here in those tests. So, but yeah, maybe before that, let's just run the application and make sure that it even works. <laughs> it could be, you know, <laughs> it will be not working and I'm telling you the not truth basically, but let's see, right? We need a few seconds for it. Oh, sorry, it's running tests. We don't want to run tests. We want to run the application. Yeah. So it's running and we will use Postman to actually call this endpoint on the controller and see what it does. No, oh, didn't run yet. Okay, application started. All right, so we have the order that is placed successfully. And in here, we can see that our event triggered. So order was placed, then user service was notified of it and also the inventory service was notified of it, right? That's, everything's cool. Okay, so now let's look into the tests. So one of those uh, 
features of Spring Modulet is that it allows for checking the integrity of those modules. So let's run this test. And if we have our application written in the clear way with the clear boundaries and we all respect those boundaries, this should pass, right? But if we have some nasty things like, for instance, here, order service, where we just, you know, taking the service from another module and just calling it, then it's, uh, you know, smelly thing to do. Uh, so our test cases should prevent us from doing such things, right? Uh, yeah, so we are waiting for the tests to run. I don't know why it takes so long for these, but yeah. Okay, so everything looks, looks to be okay, right? Uh, it was this test. So we get the application modules and we just verified them. So let's try to break it, actually. So if we go to the order service and if we uncomment this nasty code, we can see that, you know, compiler didn't prevent us from using this class in here, although it's in another module. But let's see with the test if it passes. So while it runs, uh, there we could use it in, in multiple ways, right? Because we can verify all of the modules right away. We could get one module, the order module, and verify if this, you know, is integral on the site. But in our case, we verify all of the modules. And as we can see, we have the test error in here. So yeah, let's see what it says. Cycle detected, slice inventory. Yeah, and it was triggered after we uncommented this code. So, but all right, so what's, what's actually the cycle? Where do we, in here, we don't actually, you know, explicitly reference the, or maybe we do, right? Because we have order placed event, which is in here. Yeah, so it, uh, it references. So we have this circular dependency uh, in here, and that's why it breaks the this law of, modularity, right? This test should yield us the same result because it tests the order module. So what I'm trying to paint here is that we can do tests that verify the modules. So not, you know, even not just the mm, functionality, but also the whole modules. And as we can see, it also yields some um, errors in here and it should be the same error yeah cycle detected so let's actually go here and command this thing so that we don't have any errors and there is the third uh, method in here which creates the module documentation that's interesting actually uh, so uh, spring module it has this documenter class and if we go here it has plenty of functionality to basically document our whole project so that we don't need to, you know, sit by our own and draw the diagrams or, you know, document everything. This basically takes all the modules that we have and it generates a documentation for us. So let's see. Still running. Yep. Hope it could run faster, <laughs> but it doesn't. Actually, what it does in here, if we run this test, we have this directory that is created. It's spring modulate docs. And if we go here, okay, our tests run, test run, right? Uh, we have this documentation of each and every 
module that we have in our project generated for us completely automatically. Okay, and if we try to view this thing, voila, it shows us the whole diagram regarding this, this particular module. And I think it's really good because if we have this large application with plenty of modules, and if we want to find a way of what refers to, to what, then Spring module it helps us understand how the module looks like, how it works with the rest of the system. Same for this. And if we go to the to this to this diagram, right? It draws us the whole application, so to speak. Uh, it's pretty cool, I think. Uh, it even says what is the relationship between those modules. So in this case, user module and inventory module, they listen to the order module, right? It's very cool. Um, yeah, so that's it from this example. Let's get back to our presentation. I'll probably have to start from the beginning and go through it all. Uh, yeah, so let me just go through it present day. We talked about it. Yes, yes, Spring module it demo. Yeah. So there are some other cool features that Spring module it provides us with. So if we look at this project structure that we have on our left, right, we have um, the inventory module, the order module, but we also have this internal module of the order. This is interesting because Sometimes, you know, if we, for instance, if we wanted to, from, from our inventory module, refer to the order module or like reuse some classes because most likely we would like to reuse some code from the other module, right? Uh, but there might be some code that we cannot expose to our, to, to the other module, right? Uh, so we actually have, a few, quite a few ways to to do it. I mean, to expose some of the classes to some other modules. So let's look at these. This first example is, uh, we could define it on example inventory and it's in this, um, yeah, package, package info Java, right? So if we had the package info in here, in the inventory, we could, uh, add some additional annotations to it. And what this annotation does is that it opens the whole module, this whole module for use in other modules. So we can just grab the code from it and use it, right? Oh, sorry. Yes, and we have this uh, other way of specifying what can be accessed so we could specify the allowed dependencies. So in this case, only our order module could use the inventory module, like the classes from that module right away, and other modules couldn't do it. And uh, one uh, of the other ways to do it is to define the named uh, interface and having that named interface, we could use it right to to refer to this interface in some other modules as well. And there are some a few other ways to basically manage this access to the code uh, or to the modules and code within them. Another cool thing is that we can create integration tests uh, on the level of the module. So for instance, uh, in, this, uh, in this scenario, we have this test package, right? Example order, and we specify the the test just for this package. And if we run it, then only the, the context of this module loads up. So we don't need to load the whole application or in order to, to run it, right? I mean, the integration tests for the particular module. We have also a few other really cool 
features, I must say, uh, the event management. So uh, if our application produces an event that we talked about, right? Like placing the order placement. There could be an inst instances where not all of the receivers received the message because maybe application got killed or it was, you know, evicted or something like this. So there is a way to implement the rate retry. So actually Spring takes care of it and it stores those events in the database so that, you know, when application starts up again or when the receivers are available once again, then it picks up those events and it pumps them to, to the receivers that didn't receive the message yet. Uh, we also have the ability to externalize this event bus I would say we can use queue systems like Kafka, SQS, AMQP, right? So uh, this is a very useful feature if we have our Spring Modulith application and we want to create one microservice or extract one microservice, then we don't need to worry about creating like additional API for communicating between those. And we just can configure, for instance, Kafka for communicating with that particular microservice. And we are good to go. Um, so uh, yes, and uh, another one is the integration with distributed tracing and monitoring tools. This is uh, useful, especially in the context of the Spring applications. <clears throat> because we have uh, the Spring Actuator thing, which exposes the metrics of the particular <clears throat> application. And uh, we can use it uh, in our Spring Modulit. Uh, there is actually a package Spring Modulit Actuator, and it creates those endpoints and, uh, you know, metrics tracing for each of the modules that we have. So it is very useful. And another one is the ability to observe actually what's going on in, in our application. So if we add this package, for instance, Spring Modulate Observability, then what we have uh, is that for each module and each API that this module exposes, there are being created the trace ID and this uh, other root ID, I think, right? So this is used in in distributed tracing if we are talking about the microservices. So this is the same concept, but just brought to the world of the modulitic applications, right? And if we use that, we can use, for instance, Zipkin to see what, uh, you know, how does the communication goes within this application? So this is also very useful, as we know from the microservice world, right? So yeah, so we basically went through the majority or like a great part of the features that Spring Modulit provides us with. Uh, okay, so we know all that, but what are the use cases? Where, I mean, where could we use this knowledge, right? So one of those... Uh, fields that we could use Spring Modulit in is transitioning legacy systems to the microservice architecture. So as we discussed earlier, Spring Modulit could be used as this one uh, step in between these, right? When we extract the modules and then if we need to, we can just make microservices out of these. Uh, also legacy application that need better structure. We don't necessarily need microservices because you know they solve not only the partitioning problem right they also solve the scalability and all that kind of stuff uh, of things right uh, but maybe the the legacy application that we are working on just needs a better structure right we we don't need to go full blown microservices with it so it could be also a good place to use this technology. 
Uh, another one would be small teams that want to build something great, but they don't want this microservice or overhead. I actually was working in one of the teams that, you know, we there were four of us and we were implementing the microservices from the scratch, right? It was a lot of hassle. So, you know, as you can imagine. Uh, so this is the perfect solution for when we have a small team that needs to build something that potentially should be scalable, right? So we can build it in Spring module it and then also maybe extract it to microservices in the if the need comes, right? Uh, teams seeking clear boundaries is the same as for this legacy applications, right? And also <laughs> on the other side of the spectrum, if there are uh, like too many microservices, we could maybe use Spring Modulate for actually consolidating these into a bit larger services and have <laughs> some of this hustle of our heads, right? Mm. Okay, so pretty much discussed the this Spring Modulate. Let's, uh, as the final step, look at the pros and cons of it. Uh, it can simplify our development operations also. It helps us defining the clear boundaries between the modules. So we could do modules without module it, but uh, Spring module it allows us for this clear definition and verifying if everything's okay and within its boundaries. Uh, also gradual evolution to microservices. We talked about that better testability as we could say uh, see uh, right but there are also some cons it's like it's always like that in the technology that it's not always you know flowers and birds there are some cons to it so scalability if we uh, it's still like one application right it, it can have its modules but the scalability we won't be able to scale this application like we scale services or microservices separately single point of failure if our application for instance crashes in one single or particular instance then the whole application falls uh, and it's not always suitable especially if we have those polyglot solutions where plenty of just are being used so you know, it's not uh, one solution that fits at all, but it fits some of the instances. So as a summary, we discussed what is the modulitic architecture, how it fits into this landscape of the architecture. Uh, we have seen and discussed the use cases of it. Uh, and we also, you know, touched a bit of the spring modulate and its main features, and we saw how it can help us building the modulitic applications. So will it save us all? This is the main question that was asked. No. <laughs> In general, no, but uh, it can save some of us. Uh, my intention with this uh, with this talk was to, you know, give you the idea of what the Spring Modulate is, and maybe if you are in the team, and you see, uh, you know, potential use case for this for this technology. You know, don't be shy to signal it to to your manager or to the uh, leader or to the architect that you know there could be some better way to to do stuff than, for instance, you know, going from monolith to the microservice architecture uh, from the get go. Yeah. So thank you very much uh, for your attention. Uh, Thank you for coming here to listen to what I have to say. Uh, if you want, you can contact me or find me under those um, those links. Uh, and yeah, I think it's a good uh, good time for the questions. So if you have any, don't hesitate to 